Ladies and gentlemen, the Honourable the Prime Minister, fellow countrymen, I have come to the microphone tonight to speak to you on a matter of vital importance to the future of Pakistan. In my broadcast on the 1st of this month, I referred to the dangers of provincialism. On that occasion, I reminded you of Qaeda Azam's exhortation that every one of us must jealously preserve, protect and guard the unity of the nation. He warned us that if Pakistan is not to disintegrate and if it is to become stronger, we must cease to regard ourselves as Bengalis, Punjabis or Sindhis. We must think of ourselves only as Muslims and Pakistanis. Winding up the debate in the Constituent Assembly on the imposition of Section 92A in East Bengal on July the 17th of this year, I said, I agree with Sardar Abdul Rab Nishtar when he says that this, meaning provincialism, is the greatest danger and I hope I shall get the cooperation of members of all sections of the House in our efforts, in our determined efforts to remove provincial barriers and provincial boundaries. And I hope that we shall succeed in our lifetime. At this point, the leader of the opposition had interjected by saying, we are all always for the unitary form of government. Then I went on to say, we will try to give you the next best alternative to unitary form of government. Then again, in a public speech on the 11th of September of this year at the Jahangir Park on the occasion of the death anniversary of Qaeda Azam, I pointed out that Pakistan's solidarity was threatened from within. We had deviated from the course which the Qaeda Azam had charted for us. I mentioned that internecine strife resulting from narrow parochialism, provincialism and sectarianism divide us. I explained that this was a great potential threat to our existence as a nation. I then stated, we must not only repair what damage has already been done, but strive toward promoting a concept of homogeneity. I repeat, strive toward promoting a concept of homogeneity. Once again, in my Pakistan Day speech at Jahangir Park on the 14th of August of this year, I mentioned that Quislings and fifth columnists amongst us were trying to sabotage the existence of Pakistan by spreading the venom of provincialism. I referred to the spirit of Islam which transcends all territorial boundaries. I repeat, I referred to the spirit of Islam which transcends all territorial boundaries and that it was a force which recognized no barriers. I asserted that the ideology of Pakistan was the ideology of one God, one Prophet, one Quran and this very ideology of Pakistan was to be the unifying factor in keeping the nation as one. I exhorted you to abstain from thinking in terms of being Bengalis, Punjabis or Sindhis, Pathans or Baluchis. I am sure you are all fully aware of the dangers of provincialism. There is by now a universal demand that this evil which threatens our future existence as a united nation must be eradicated from our body politic. Now the question is, where do we go from here? Obviously, mere condemnation of this evil, however vehement that condemnation may be, or mere awareness of the danger, however acute that awareness may be, will not help. We must go to the root of the matter. Within Pakistan, there are many artificial divisions among us 
that engender a parochial outlook on national affairs. My colleagues and I have given very careful and deep thought to this matter. We have informally consulted leaders of public opinion from all parts of the country and from all walks of life. I have personally sounded the views of a cross-section of responsible leaders in politics, trade, commerce and industry. Such consultations have led all of us to the irresistible conclusion that the basic cause of the prevalence of provincialism in Pakistan is the existence of artificial boundaries which divide the nation's political and economic life into many compartments. We are all, without a single exception, convinced that unless these compartments are abolished, provincialism cannot be eliminated. As I indicated in my speech, on the floor of the Constituent Assembly, the best form of government is naturally of the unitary type. Most of you, I am sure, would like to see the whole of Pakistan constituted into a single political and administrative unit. If this were feasible, we would have unhesitatingly done it. But in our country, we are faced with a fact of geography which cannot be ignored. Our country consists of two separate units, separated by a distance of 1,000 miles of foreign territory. Under a unitary system of government, both the zones of Pakistan will have to be governed under one administrative setup. Therefore, any arrangement which would locate the political and administrative center of gravity of East Bengal in Karachi would be basically unsound and inexpedient. It would deny the people of East Bengal a government of their own located in their province. It would make them feel cut off from the center of all governmental activities. Therefore, in view of our geographic peculiarity, a unitary type of government is both impractical and impolitic. In my speech of July the 17th, in the Constituent Assembly, I promised to give the country the next best alternative to a unitary form of government. By this I meant that we would give a type of government which is the closest to the unitary form. As it is not possible to unify the whole of Pakistan, we should at least unify the whole of West Pakistan. There is no justification, either politically or administratively, for maintaining the existing provincial divisions in West Pakistan. They are not warranted by geographic, ethnic, cultural or economic consideration. As a matter of fact, their existence has served to breed provincialism. During the last seven years, these artificial divisions have helped not to promote unity but to encourage discord, not to reinforce the solidarity of Pakistan but to undermine it, not to promote its economic progress, but to retard it. These political divisions may have been necessary to a foreign rule when the British strengthened their administration by dividing and thus weakening us. Such divisions have no place in a free Pakistan. Today all areas and all the people must share equally in the country's common resources and share alike in the responsibilities to develop it to the utmost of its potentiality. One look at the map of West Pakistan will convince you that there is no reason why the people in one part of the western zone should be cut off or be separated by provincial barriers from the people in the other sectors. The provincial boundaries seem to be completely illogical. For economic reasons also, it is essential that there should be one government in the West. Throughout West Pakistan, there is the same agricultural economy depending for its sustenance on the same water resources and subject to the same economic forces. Therefore, the development of the whole area can be ensured and speeded up 
only if it is treated as a single economic unit and its resources are exploited to the maximum advantage of all areas alike, which now are divided into separate units by artificial political boundaries. The hydroelectric resources of the frontier must, of necessity, sustain industries in the Punjab. The wealth of the Punjab and Karachi and the resources of Sindh and Bhawalpur must help to develop and fortify the underdeveloped, potentially rich areas of the frontier and Baluchistan to the common advantage of the country as a whole. The history of the last seven years provides distressing instances of how the existing provincial divisions have hindered and in some cases frustrated the overall economic development of West Pakistan. Our country currently is a poor one. We must therefore husband our resources so as to make the maximum use of whatever we have. We can ill afford the wasteful luxury of six or seven separate provincial administrations with their paraphernalia of provincial governments, cabinets, legislatures, secretariats and what have you. In, in East Pakistan, we have one provincial administration for a population of 44 million. How then can we justify six or seven provincial administrations for a population of only 34 million? What has been found to be a practical proposition for the whole of East Pakistan should also be practical for the whole of West Pakistan. As a matter of fact, in pre-partition India, the whole of Bengal, comprising of what is now East and West Bengal, with a total population of 60 million, was under one provincial administration. If it is to be our objective to promote maximum cohesion and economy in the administration, and if we are to go forward with the economic development of our country, we must have as few administrative units as possible. With the limitation imposed by geography, we can reduce our administrative units to the minimum of two. And by doing this, it will be possible for us to fulfill our claim to serve the common man to his maximum benefit by conserving our resources and utilizing them not by wasteful extravagances for the maintenance of costly administrative machineries, but by devoting the savings to nation-building activities. Abolition of political boundaries in West Pakistan is so patently in the interest of the country that the proposal to constitute it into a single unit has evoked instantaneous support from almost all right-thinking leaders of West Pakistan whom I have consulted. No doubt, some opposition to the proposal has been voiced in the press by certain quarters. With an idea so revolutionary and so contrary to our accustomed way of political and administrative thinking, it is but natural that there should be some difference of opinion on the subject. In this case, such disagreement that has been expressed arises principally from two reasons. First, there is opposition from certain vested interests who would be adversely affected if the existing units in West Pakistan were merged into a single province. Such an opposition is only to be expected. They come generally from persons who place their own interests before the interest of the country. The larger interest of the country must predominate over the interest of a few. The second category of opposition arises from certain genuine fears sparked by the ignorance of the political and administrative implications of the one unit move. This is understandable because these implications have never been publicly defined. There seems to be a fear that if West Pakistan were to become a single administrative unit, the interests of the areas in the existing smaller provinces will suffer and that the areas in bigger provinces will benefit and progress more rapidly. This is fallacious and has no foundation in fact. 